Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Bat, how goes it today? It's, uh, you know, I'm being treated like by the world like a baby treats a diaper. It's uh, one of those days. But that's a visual I just don't want to imagine. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, uh, let's, let's move on to something different then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are very honored today to have Dr. Rebecca Ruby with us. She's a pathologist at the UK Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. There you go. From the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory and uh, happy to have her. And it, it's an incredible uh, resource that we have to have that so close. And those guys are so good and they do such a great job. It's, yeah. uh, it's an honor to have her here with us today. Yeah, we're just so lucky to have that amount of information and um, that amount of timeliness of that information and right on her doorstep. And Rebecca's an interesting character. She's actually pathology and medicine trained, so she can actually put things together sort of before and after. So, Yep, very sharp. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to her insights on uh, the functioning of the diagnostic lab and also um, what she sees as its role supporting yeah. the industry. So and if you're watching on uh, YouTube with us, there will be some pictures that she's brought along with her today. Um, also, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, hit the like button, uh, do, what's, do what's right for Peter and I. Actually, do what's right for you and your family. That's the very best thing for you and your family, to hit that like button. Yeah, we'd like some likes because I don't have enough friends. <laughs> there we go. So let's uh, let's bring Dr. Ruby in. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome to Stallside. Up next, Dr. Rebecca Ruby. Welcome to Stallside. Today we have Dr. Rebecca Ruby from the University of Kentucky Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. <laughs> Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Thanks for being with us. I, I was just, I'm, I'm still stuck on the laboratory thing. And for, the, for those of you who don't speak that brand of English, that's the lab. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> and I always thought a lab was like a golden colored friendly dog. <laughs> but my, I, my apologies for yeah, going there. Yeah, uh, I've been a former. So divided by a common language, but I, I speak New Zealand English, American English, Kentucky English. You do. You have the Kentucky English down there? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Y'all. Yep. Yep. Okay. Rebecca, so, thank you for being here with us. Yeah, we we, we apologize for the next 30 minutes. It could get loose. <laughs> so tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. So I was born and raised in Northern California, right outside of the Bay Area. And I did my undergraduate master's degree at UC Davis, so not too far from home. And while I was there, I worked in the large animal ICU at UC Davis Vet School, which is where I met a whole bunch of equine veterinarians. They got me started on this path. And then when I was finishing up my master's degree, Dr. Madigan emailed and said, there is a spot in New Zealand that would like some technical help during full season if you're or anyone else is available. So I flew out to New Zealand for six months and ended up staying for six years <laughs> and went to vet school there at Massey. Um, and then I came back. I did a six-month fellowship in internal medicine at Haggard, which was kind of my introduction to Lexington, and then moved to Ithaca, Cornell, for a pathology residency, and then moved to Iowa, moved to Ames, and started an equine medicine residency and finished that up and then took a job down here. So I've been in a bunch of different places, but have finally settled down in Lexington. See, Bart, six years in New Zealand, and look what a well-rounded <laughs> character this person has turned out to be. That is great. That I know great. a lot about sheep. <laughs> I'm glad you said yeah. that because uh, woolly, it was woolly, on the tip of my tongue. Woolly little devils. Yeah, yeah we won't go there. So um, tell us a bit about your position at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory for Bart's benefit. Sure. So um, I work at the lab as one of six, about to be seven, veterinary pathologists. Um, and that is just a small portion of the whole lab kind of employee scheme. So we have about at any time between 60 and 7D employees split between different mm -hmm. sections. Um, so we have a full pathology unit, but we also have serology, virology, molecular diagnostics, bacteriology. Um, and we see cases from throughout the country, primarily Kentucky, but plenty of other states as well, and all different types of species. So because of our location, we, of course, see a lot of horses. That's about 50% of our caseload. The remainder is split between bovines, which makes up about 25%, and then a smattering of dogs, cats, chickens, alpacas, turtles, snakes, kind of whatever animal exists out there. We'll usually see one or two in a year. What, what, what specimens do you get from out of state, from out of the area? 
Um, so some are equine biopsies. So just because of the density of horses we see here, we have kind of a reputation for recognizing different diseases. So we'll get, you know, we have the liver biopsy coming in from University of Minnesota um, and some other places just kind of as additional information for them. Um, and then just, you know, I think people that have trained here are trained in Lexington that like to send us back samples as well. So typically biopsies, but we do also accept what we call field necropsies, where the veterinarian on the farm or on site has done the actual autopsy necropsy exam, and they take tissue sets and they send them back to us to look at microscopically. Gotcha. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. So what does a typical day look like? For Dr. Ruby. So for me, um, if I am on the necropsy floor, which is probably going to be my favorite type of day, I will get into the laboratory and our receiving team, who anyone outside of the lab will have talked to on a regular basis, will have already accessioned the cases for the day that are already there. I'll look over my case list and I'll go down to the necropsy floor and start cases for the day. We have amazing technicians. Um, we have anywhere from six to 14 technicians on the necropsy floor throughout the week, and they will work with us to kind of go through each case individually. So we get a submission form. We'll read that submission, make sure there's all the information we need on it, and then we'll go ahead and we'll start, start the autopsy. So open up the animals, look through everything, and see if we can find an answer or if we need to do additional testing during the busy season, we can have up to 30, 35 animals in one day. During the slow season, that usually drops down to about 10. Um, and then come off the necropsy floor, communicate with clients or referring vets who've called in throughout the day, look at other cases that may have come in. And then on that same day, people will mail in those biopsies or cytology slides. Um, so look at those and try to look, do those as well. Okay. So what's topical uh, in equine necropsy at the moment? So I think, um, you know, central Kentucky equine necropsy, we're always interested in our full crop. So we've started to see some of our early abortions come in already this year. And we know from history, a lot of those are not going to have diagnoses. They're typically not going to be our really infectious things like leptospirosis or herpes. But we have, I believe, already had one case of Potomac horse fever associated abortion this year. Mm. Um, and certainly some bacterial placentitis have come through. So we kind of start early this year. You know, we always run a very routine set of tests on those. So almost every equine abortion is going to get tested for herpes, tested for lepto, culture to look for bacterial agents, um, and then also serology on the fetal blood if we have it for lepto as well. And that just lets us detect really early, hopefully in the season, if we are seeing what we think is a higher than normal incidence. So like in years when we've had really increased nocardiform cases, we'll start to notice as early as December usually that we're seeing more than we would in a typical year. And then we can hopefully communicate with everyone is that being seen in the field, and do we need to look further into what's going on? You mentioned a number of infectious causes. Um, what about non-infectious causes of abortion? What would be something you'd think about at this time of year? So maternal stress is a big one um, that we always consider, and it's often hard to prove, but certainly as we go through sales and mares moving around throughout the country as well as just central Kentucky, we worry about that. Um, you know, mares that have other diseases going on, they, of course, are not, you know, incapable of having colic or other infectious disease themselves. And that stress sometimes will be in our clinical history. And then there's, you know, probably a large number of causes of abortion that we just don't know about yet. Are there genetic mutations that allow fetuses to not come to full term? Um, you know, is there just mismatch of the maternal blood supply to the foal sometimes? So there's still a huge amount of work, I think, to that can be done with these early abortions where we don't find an answer. Yeah, there is because it's interesting. We, you know, you, and you said this is abortion season because we do we do get that from here mm -hmm. till the beginning of the year, and it doesn't. You know, those marriages might be due to full January. They might be due to full May. They're still. This is the season they have abortions, and then once we hit January, they kind of shut off. Yeah. And yeah. so it's there, there's something out there. But you you mentioned something. Um, that we might not get a diagnosis on these, and a lot of them we don't. Can you kind of touch on that? Because it is a point of frustration for both veterinarians and clients that we send these abortions in and, and don't get answers on them. Sure. So I would say you 
the best thing in a case of abortion, you almost don't want an answer most of the time because our answer, <laughs> our answers yeah. are you have lepto on your farm, you have herpes on your farm, you have fungal or necardiform placentitis, which those are a pain, but usually not going to be a problem for the other mares on the farm. Or you've got ascending placentitis, and then you have to go back and look at your mare and see is there a reason why, you know, she got ascending placentitis. So an abortion of unknown etiology is almost the disease that you want from a herd health standpoint. Um, and then, unfortunately, there just are so many reasons beyond our understanding yeah. for why they do lose some of those foals. Yeah, I think you make a good point in that so many things go right and so many things have to go right so many times to get that fetus to term. When something goes wrong, this is just Mother Nature being right. But speaking about non-infectious causes, one that um, we hear a lot about is umbilical cord torsion, and that can be a really eye of the beholder situation. So what's your take on umbilical cord torsion as a cause of abortion in, in these so I, I think it definitely, you know, it's undeniably a cause of abortion. Um, I think you need to see an umbilical cord that is tight. So, you know, not ha you can't just have twists in that cord. It needs to be tight, look hemorrhagic and edematous and swollen and red. And then ideally, you know, to really solidify it, if it's still attached to that fetus, we'll see distension of the urinary bladder, the urachus, you know, actual evidence that there's probably been pulling on the external portion of that abdomen. And then sometimes we'll even see changes in the kidneys of those folds, suggesting you've had that much backflow from mm -hmm. the umbilicus into the urinary system. Those, I think, are true causes of abortion. When we just see loose twists or, you know, a few twists without evidence of really t changes to that tissue, it's hard to say for sure that that was the cause. It's kind of like the long umbilical cord conundrum. You can have a really long umbilical cord in normal folds, and you can have a really long umbilical cord in abortions. And while we think it probably isn't great for the baby, we can't always prove that that's actually the cause of the abortion. You mentioned no cardioform abortion. Um, could you expand on that? Because that is just some years such a bane of the existence yeah. of this industry. And, you know, I was lucky or unlucky enough to have my second full season be a pretty big necardioform year, so 2020. Um, and that is, you know, it's a cause of placentitis, which we don't fully understand the pathogenesis. We associate it with necardiform type bacteria, of which Amicolotopsis and Crossiella equi are the most commonly isolated, um, but other things like Streptomyces will also be found. And what's unique about that type of placentitis, it mostly happens at the base of your uterine horns in that placenta. So it's got a unique distribution, typically a really mucoid appearance on the chorionic surface. And it's one of those things that we just, we don't know how it gets there. So if it's, you know, bloodborne or if it's from the environment and it kind of quiescently lives in the uterus and then starts to grow in the right amount of conditions. But we see those fetuses aborted mostly, we think, due to malnutrition as they lose their chorionic blood supply. Um, and so during that season, you know, I think it was a pretty good response from Gluck, which is, you know, one of the centers on campus that is part of our department the diagnostic lab and amazing from the farms around here as well, well, where, you know, Dr. Ball kind of in the midst of it organized submission of a lot of different samples and everything. And I know there's multiple ongoing projects trying to figure it out, but Dr. Ball's group has shown a relation to hot, dry falls preceding a year of a high abortion. And so hopefully with the rain that we've had, um, you know, hopefully it hasn't been too dry, but there's so much more to be done with that disease, I think. Yeah, I think what makes it really hard to study is how do you induce the condition? And I've been to talks with people who said, you know, we have introduced, we've done AI, we've introduced the organism and they can't reproduce the disease. Is there any advance on that that you know of? So um, Dr. Alan Page with the repro group at Glock right now, they are actually, this year, there's a set of farms that agreed to have um, antibody responses measured in their mares. And this is going to be very early work, and I don't think he even has the results. We probably won't have the results till the end of the season. The goal with that work is going to be try to determine what time of year those mares are actually exposed to the organism. So, you know, are we seeing exposure to 
lots of mares in April and May, and so is it not a time of gestation that matters? Is it a condition of the environments? Or is it something that has to be introduced, you know, around breeding or even around foaling the previous year? Like you said, so many more questions than answers. Um, you know, and I think part of the problem is it is sporadic, and so to get continuous good funding to do a lot of research in this area has been difficult because it comes, it ruins your year, and then it goes away for a few more years. And like rotavirus this year, something new pops up, you know, and kind of demands urgent attention. And so to get a five-year, 10-year study, which is probably what you'd need to get multiple outbreaks going, is just, it's still a difficulty. But the economic impact is still huge, even though it's sporadic. Do we, do we have numbers on that? Do you know what the economic impact of Nocardia was last year or two years ago? We lost, you know, so it was about 30% of the abortions that we saw were Nocardia form. Um, and I think we saw about 550 come through the lab. But like Dr. Morrissey said, people stop submitting them after they Yeah, No, we did. It's, it's true because you, you recognize it and you go, okay, yeah, yeah that's what it is. And it's no respecter of the value of the fetus, right? And the the economic cost is just staggering for the loss of that foal's not born. It's not red. It's not weaned. It doesn't go through yearling prep. It doesn't go to the sale. And they don't pay stud fees on and them either. So, yeah. so, so there's, there's, it's it's, it's, it, it affects a lot of folks down the line. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a, and it's, you know, for us, it's distressing too to start seeing them come in the numbers that we do in those years during the height of season for us. And I'm sure it's worse on the farms. We'll get five, ten in one day, and it is, it's frustrating just to see that many, and often near-term foals. Yeah. So, you know, they were that close, and then yep. they didn't quite make it all the way. Yeah, Or the, or the ones that did make it all the way, and, and they're compromised. Yeah. Because yeah. we had a, a fair share of those. Yeah. yeah, we get those, and you manage the placentitis to get them through, and then you have this, like, starved fetus that's never going to reach its potential, and everybody loses, right? Yeah, um, leptospirosis as a cause of abortion, you mentioned that. Um, there's been a vaccine uh, recently that's been uh, put out. Um, how has that changed that for the D-Lab? So we typically only see at most maybe 10 lepto cases come through the lab in a year. If that, we see significantly lower numbers than that in some years. And so while I don't feel... I don't feel you can prove the vaccine is the reason for that without doing the epidemiology and saying those mares were all vaccinated. It does, you know, it does seem like the numbers of leptospiral abortions that we see in central Kentucky are pretty low now. And I know there's a lot of monitoring on the farms with titers and the mares and everything. Um, it'd be, I'd be fascinated. I haven't actually talked to any of the vets on farm to know if they're seeing differences in their titers um, following the vaccine. But it certainly seems to be very much more of a sporadic thing now rather than a continuous high number. Okay. You mentioned about fungal causes of abortion. Um, could you expand on that? Yeah. So for the most part, the two funguses we associate with abortion are aspergillus and candida. Both come from the environment and both more than likely, you know, make their way in the same way that a bacteria would. So through the cervix and then just ascending um, because they grow slower. They seem to be able to make it further into the actual body of the placenta and can actually sometimes have a, you know, multiple spots in the placenta they're affecting. They actually can mirror nicardia form because that classic appearance of nicardia form is that thick brown mucoid debris on top of the chorionic surface, fungal placentitises will look similar. So, you know, early in the season, if we don't know if we're going to have an acardioform season or not, I would always err on the side of submitting a placenta like that to determine, is it fungal? Is it an acardioform? Because I do think that's going to change also how you just look at that mare, Mm -hmm. um, because we don't blame the mares for an acardioform placentitis at this time. But, you know, if we've got ascending infections, we would like to know why they happened. Sure. All right. So um, my mare's just aborted. Um, what's the best thing I can do to give you the best opportunity to provide a diagnosis? So first and foremost, and I will say our farms are amazing for this, try to find the placenta and the fetus. Um, I am amazed around here people can find the smallest of abortions, which I just don't know how they do it. And then you want to basically, as quickly as possible, get them into a clean bag of some kind, if you're not within driving distance of the diagnostic lab, into a cooler. 
Um, otherwise, we just have them driven to the diagnostic lab, dropped off the full fetus, full placenta, and that allows us to do the most complete exam. And we'll pick the tissues that we want to use for testing based on what we see. Okay. You brought us a few uh, images today. Would you like to talk to those? Sure, sure. Let me know when you can see them. Are we good to go? All right. So this first one that I've pulled up, um, this is actually what we were talking about. So this is an acardiform placentitis. So here on the left, we've got the whole placenta. This is pretty severely affected. It's just covered in that brown mucoid material on your chorionic surface. And that is just kind of our classic And I can understand why practitioners stop submitting them at some point once they've seen a bunch in one year. But importantly, here on the right, this is a close-up of where that mucoid material becomes kind of the healthier-looking red velvety villi that we're used to in a good placenta. And this little area in between them that almost looks like a raised cornmeal surface, if you were going to not submit the placenta, that's the section that you would want to sample for testing. That's where those bacteria are actually proliferating the most and where inflammation is happening the most. So we kind of think of these like a brush fire um, and it kind of burns out the center of the lesion and those bacteria spread outwards. So if you were ever going to you know, target an area for one of these, that is the area that you'd want to target. So when we talk to practitioners outside of central Kentucky who have to send us just pieces of tissue, that's what we always tell them. Um, and then the other thing that I kind of show, wanted to show is just we haven't really talked about herpes abortion yet, but I would say herpes abortion is probably the thing that at the diagnostic lab and also on farms makes everyone kind of skip a beat because they have to <laughs> yes, think <it> does. <laughs> yeah. nobody, nobody wants to be in the middle of a herpes abortion storm. So this is a fetus that came in and... It's almost classic herpes viral abortion from the necropsy floor. So we've got little white dots in the liver. Our lungs look dark and red. If if we got a little closer on the lungs, you'd see little white dots there as well. And one of the things I really like about our laboratory is because everyone does value the equine industry so much. A fetus like this, if it comes in, you know, early-ish in the day, we'll get a result that same day for you usually. So Dr. Maples, who is our amazing diagnostic services coordinator, We have a phone that gets cleaned regularly that we use from the necropsy floor, and we pick it up, and we say, Deb, I have a herpes suspect. She'll call our virology section. They'll come grab the tissue straight away. They'll do a fluorescent antibody and get that result out as quick as possible, which I think just gets everyone, you know, if it's negative, peace of mind, we're still going to look with other testing. But if it's positive, you can go back to the farm and you can start all the things that you need to do when you have a herpes case. So, you know, just being able to recognize things like that really rapidly is probably one of the biggest services we provide. No, that's that's good. No, I'd say most of us probably don't recognize that that happens. And Yeah, I think a lot of people don't appreciate the sort of like the, the effort and the, the brain power that goes into getting the answers that we get so quickly. I mean, yep. we're extremely well served. Oh, it's, it was spoiled. <laughs> yeah, we are spoiled very spoiled. I mean, it's just around the corner and we can get good information really quickly. Um, moving on from um, equine abortions, um, sudden death yeah. in foals and or weanlings. Um, yeah. How should people act in that situation to give, again, the best chance for you to get a, so an answer? So they should act without panic and quickly. Um, is my favorite combination. (laughs) So if it is, so again, because everything's seasonal in Kentucky, um, a lot of our weanling and yearling deaths happen in the hot summer, just because I think that's when a lot of weaning happens Mm -hmm. and horses are getting moved in new environments. Um, And the heat is the biggest enemy of a good necropsy exam. So gastrointestinal tract on a hot summer day is going to very, very rapidly start to decompose. And if so, we're, if we're worried about anything to do with the gastrointestinal tract, getting them into the lab is most important. Um, providing a good history. So sudden death is fine if there's truly nothing else in that animal's history. But if you did move pastures or you found it next to a fence or you found, you know, two dead next to each other or there was a big lightning storm, include that all in the history because that aids us. Um, And then, you know, always be kind of prepared in cases of sudden death, again, to not get an answer but to know that we usually looked really, really hard before we did not give you an answer. So most cases of sudden death come in. We do the routine autopsy, so that's looking at heart, lungs, liver, everything in the abdomen and GI tract. 
we almost always, well, in all cases, we'll split the skull. And so we'll look for evidence of fractures in the head. And then most of the time, especially in the little ones, even if neurologic necropsy isn't checked, we will usually at least split the cervical, so the neck region, to look for a broken neck as well. And then we'll look at things microscopically. And so if after all of that, we really don't have anything, usually we have to say it was probably a cardiac arrhythmia of unknown cause, which unfortunately happens in all of our species. Mm. So if you couldn't get the entire carcass of a foal or a weanling and you're in that situation where you just had to take samples, if you were there with somebody while they're doing that, what would you ask them to get? So if they open the animal and they don't find anything, that's the hardest part, right? So if they, I'd always say just start doing your necropsy, you may find something really obvious like a gastrointestinal rupture. If you don't see anything, then we always encourage people to take a full set of fresh tissue and a full set of tissue that goes in formalin. Now, the formalin pieces are, of course, small. They should be, you know, only one centimeter or so thick, and that should include all your major organs, so liver, lung, heart, kidney, intestine, and then fresh tissue of the same thing, but significantly bigger, about the size of the palm of your hand at least. And then gastric contents, colon contents, would also be really helpful in those cases. And brain, of course, if you can. Um, I like to include, if people can do it, Spinal fluid, ocular fluid, a sample of blood if the animal was still fairly fresh, um, and then photos as well if you can when you open the animal because we may be able to detect something in a photo that's not quite as obvious to someone who doesn't see as many of these and then ship that all chilled um, to your diagnostic laboratory. Okay. Any other images you'd like to show us? Um, just These are kind of some fun I'll switch the beginning, but this is just kind of, I figured when you guys asked me, it kind of crossed my mind. I'm like, I don't know if anyone really knows what we do. So this was just a fun, um, sometimes we do get answers in cases of sudden death. So mm -hmm. this was a little weanling who was found dead in his stall. And when we did the necropsy, the pericardial sac, which has been removed, actually had a huge amount of blood in it. And he had ruptured his right um, atrium. For no good reason. So this was one of those things that there was no underlying disease process or anything that we could find. So this is to illustrate, one, sometimes we do find a reason, but I don't know how much that really helps because, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't a common condition. This isn't something you could prevent, but it was very weird. So maybe congenital lesion? Maybe congenital lesion, maybe a little area of previous inflammation mm -hmm. that scarred over that we couldn't find that left some weakened tissue in that area, um, but no fractured ribs or anything overlying the heart that mm -hmm. suggests you know, trauma to that area. So just very, very odd cause of sudden death in that critter. And then um, this, we haven't talked about this topic really, but this one came up a lot this year because we had the new rotavirus identified. But this is what those gastroduodenal ulceration syndrome foals look yeah, like. Yeah, it's still too painful for me to talk about this. And that that's completely fair. Um, but this just shows, you know, how diseased those guys can get. And I included this just to highlight you know, as a pathologist, we really do get to see everything. So when I was an internist, you know, we use all the imaging modalities, ultrasound, radiographs, rectal exam, and there's just such a limited to what you can see, even endoscopy. You're not going to be able to see things as clearly as you can when you look at, you know, the entire organ laid out in front of you. And so hopefully we feed back important information back to our clinicians by just being able to show how much disease tissue there is outside of even what you could kind of identify. Right. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me sometimes how much pathology is in there and yet the animal was remarkably yeah. good until it wasn't. Well, and that's what's incredible is, you know, we joke that cows are tougher than horses, but there are some tough horses yeah. out there that make it a really long time before they show any disease processes. Yeah. And then this was another one of your good sudden death cases where we've got the fracture of that basisphenoid bone underneath the skull, and we've just got all of that hemorrhage associated. And again, one of kind of the unique things about pathology is we get to see such a spectrum of disease. Mm -hmm. So this one with all of the hemorrhage, that just happened that day. They saw the horse flip over. And then this animal was chronically neurologic, and they had seen him fall down about three months before he came into us, and he just never came right. And you can see at that exact same location, we've just got this big, big area of kind of new bone formation 
and loss of some of that joint space and everything. And this is what that looks like chronically. So just one of those things that, you know, I thought was interesting from a pathologist perspective and also an owner perspective as to, you know, we do find reasons, even when it seems like they get up and they do better for a while, the body does not always heal in the way it should. And so sometimes we can identify that for people as well. Yeah, horses flipping over backwards anytime that's in a history is never a good thing. No, yeah. no it's not. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, that was a good tutorial, and um, again, appreciate all that you guys you guys do for us. You did an amazing job with the, and you know, we had Emma on. Yep. It, it's it's great to have that backup, and like Peter and I, I said, it's a resource that I don't think that people fully because because we've got it and it's so readily available that uh we just we just don't appreciate it like we sh- like we should yeah. yeah and emma's such a great liaison between everyone between the farms and the clinics and gluck and the diagnostic lab you know i don't know how she knows which direction she's supposed to drive every morning but she does an amazing job in situations like that she just does a big circle and keeps going <laughs> until she stops <laughs> but but that's exactly right. People don't, uh, I think, appreciate the wealth of knowledge that's in the diagnostic lab and the Gluck Centre as well and just how lucky we are around here to be able to get quality information so quickly because if we weren't here, we'd be waiting days for answers and we can get answers so quickly. And you know, given the concentration of horses here and the value of the horses here, I mean, that timeliness of information is invaluable. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and as University of Kentucky employees, you know, we really we do work for our stakeholders and for, you know, the people of Kentucky as much as we can. And so we do try to do that job well. But the stakeholders are even bigger than just the state of Kentucky. It's it's horses around the world that are being benefited from the work that's being done in the at the VDL. So. It is a pretty unique place. There's not too many places in the world that are going to have this concentration of horses, this concentration of veterinary care and this um on-site access to pathology services. I mean, where else in the world can you do that? True. Very few places. Yeah, and we do have, you know, the hidden gem, I think, that we never really talk about for some reason is, you know, a lot of our pathologists are active researchers as well. And so, you know, you've got someone like Dr. Janes who did her PhD with Steve Reed in Wobbler disease, you know, and the information that's come out of that has been just so hugely helpful on so many levels. So Mm -hmm. I think that is... A really big thing as well. What, what's the most interesting case you've ever seen? I, I should have asked you this before you walked in the door. So, uh, not to put you on the spot like that, but <laughs> but we'll put you on the spot. We'll anyway. put you on the spot like that. Um, I think it was honestly a foal that you know how some foals have they've chosen they will not live, and this foal had an infected umbilicus, a had bled out into its stomach through mastic. Massive gastric ulceration, had septic peritonitis, three septic joints, and still, and pneumonia, and still made it to like 10 days of age. And while I hated seeing that, I was amazed that, like, the history was it was nursing 12 hours beforehand, and it was a standard bread, so, you know, different breed than what we usually see, but it was incredible just to see how much that animal could, you know, live through before it kind of succumbed to something. So I think that's the most interesting horse case I've seen. I've certainly seen, I saw a rhinoceros once. Okay. That was pretty cool. Did you really? (laughs) Not in Kentucky, but yeah. But every, every case is interesting because finding an answer is kind of why we're there. Oh, I appreciate yeah. the standard bread fall because, like me, it wants to die with a full mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> we all do. Yeah. Rebecca, thanks for your time. This has been great, and uh, I think it's given everybody a really good insight into the uh, veterinary diagnostic laboratory and um, how it's really supportive of the industry in this town. Yeah, thank and you around guys the world. so much. Yeah, thank you again. That's Appreciate great. It. And that was Stall Side for this week. We've been with Dr. Rebecca Ruby. See you next time. time.
Why the podcast? Root and Riddle Veterinary Pharmacy has a relatively small marketing budget, especially when you compare us with our competitors. I understand that marketing is important, but telling people that you exist and what you do and why your products or services are different is a must. I thought about what makes us unique, and I realized I wanted to give people something of real value. That's how the podcast idea evolved. I wanted to use the money we had set aside for marketing, not to tell people who we are, but rather to show them, to open up how we do things and give something of value at the same time. The content of this podcast is designed to do exactly that. It's not going to serve as a shameless plug for pharmacy products or services. We want you to know who we are, that quality is uncompromised, that we care about people and their animals. If there are specific topics that you would like us to cover or guests that you would like to hear from, please email us at stallside at rrvp.com. Hope you enjoy the show. Just one more note, nothing that we talk about here today should be construed as veterinary advice. That's why you have a relationship with your own veterinarian. Thank you for listening.